reveal your favourite neuromyth. So we might start with Barbara. Okay, so, so mine, I'm going to get the microphones on, is that, that myth that we use only 10% of our brain. And I'm um, not exactly sure where that, that came from, but certainly is not true. Uh, as we know, over the course of the day, we use all of our brain in different activities and different functions, and certainly the individuals I work with who have learning difficulties, if there's any part of the brain that isn't functioning well, it impacts them. So there's no area of the brain that's superfluous and isn't critical and isn't important. So I think that myth does certainly a disservice to the, the students that I work with that are struggling with learning problems and a small percentage of the group that I work with also have traumatic head injury. And certainly if you have loss of function in an area, you experience the consequence of that. Yes, thank you. And also if when someone has a stroke, you know, they all experience damage, so they must, you know, I was thinking they must damage that one 10% that, that's <laughs> useful, so. Yes, thank you. Michael. I'll go along with that one too, the 10% myth, but I think there's a slight misunderstanding here. There, there is a sense in which we only get to about 1% or perhaps less of our potential, and that shouldn't alarm anybody because if you think about it, there are 7,000 languages in the world, and every newborn child has the potential to learn all of them. But there's no way you can do that. So part of the reason we don't uh, realise our potential, of course, is there simply isn't brain space to do it. Uh, so what this means, of course, is we're all constructed differently in terms of our environment. Uh, so I think there is a sense in which we can never reach the potential of any human being that any human being can reach. The other thing I'd like to mention as a myth is the left brain, right brain myth. Uh, the, the notion that they're completely different, as different as people think that men and women are. <laughs> um, and I think that's caused great mischief and a great deal of uh, wrong thinking about the way the brain works. But we can come back to that if you like. All right, can you, can you just elaborate a little bit more on the, on, you know how some people say, oh, I'm really left brain, I'm really logical. And other people go, I'm, I'm right brain, I'm really creative. So you're saying that's actually not the case. Well, uh, some people are, are indeed more creative than other people. Uh, some people are more logical than other people. But I don't think anybody's linked that to what used to be called hemisphericity, that, mm -hmm. the, that we all have our own hemisphere we like to kind of, uh, to kind of live in. And I think uh, nobody's linked uh, these individual differences to being left-brained or right-brained. Uh, the other one is, is creativity. Uh, the notion is that um, the right brain is creative. There's a famous book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain that yes. some of you may have seen mm -hmm. by Betty Edwards. I think it's quite a good book, and I think it probably does teach people how to be uh, creative or maybe how to draw, but I don't think it's got anything to do with the fact that you're training people to be right-brained. We've been studying uh, brain asymmetry with brain imaging. Uh, we have now something like 200 cases looking explicitly at the differences, left-right brain differences, uh, for language, uh, for face recognition, and for uh, spatial perception, and we found absolutely no sex differences. Mm -hmm. That sort of fell off your graph because it only was up to 2008, oh. but um, yeah. Yeah, I've read studies too that a mm. baby will, whether it's a male or a female, will naturally orient towards a face, regardless of what other pictures, mm -hmm. and it's not like boy, boy, right. boy babies will orient to a truck, they will orient to, to the face as well. <laughs> and Damon? Someone will say, I'm sorry I'm late, it's, I'm a right brain person, you know, I'm so, or I, I'm sorry I cheated on you, but I'm very creative, it's because I'm a right brain person. And so what, what, what people are, are doing is, they're seeking um, a sort of natural foundation for their own learned behaviour. Um, and it's, it's a way of excluding yourself from responsibility. Because it's not me, it's nature that's doing it. And then, okay, so one of the myths that, that most interests me, and I, I'm careful of using the word myth because the, the area of myth historically shouldn't be used pejoratively. There's nothing, it's not actually a synonym for falsity. But let's put that aside. Um, <laughs> One, one falsity that bothers me is the idea that thinking is something that happens sort of in a space in here, or that the mind is sort of best understood in, in here. It's something that happens weirdly in a space inside your head. Now, it's true that that's where the brain is, but when you think about thinking, it's embodied. 
To, to what it is to be human involves experience of yourself in space and time. So if you think of the metaphors we use, for example, we might sp uh, speak about uh, a sportsman's career going up, or we might talk about being held back in our studies. Now, those notions depend upon an embodied sense of what it is to be pulled back or to move up and to feel yourself ascending over others relative to gravity and so on. So a lot of these concepts we have, a lot of these metaphors are fleshy. They're entangled with humans who have bodies, who are bodies. So when we think about thinking, we need to build that sort of that flesh into the picture. So we grasp your meaning. <laughs> so we grasp my, exactly. In fact, that's an example. When, when um, Descartes, his famous book, um, talks about the division between the mind and the body, between the, the world of thinking and the world of matter, all the way through the text, he uses metaphors of making progress, of moving forward, of grasping. So he's, we're so familiar with our bodies. We are our bodies we forget their contribution to thought. I don't see significant difference. I mean, I see between males and females coming in with, with a range of different you know, cognitive um, challenges or problems, and I don't see really any, any sex differences in, in the work that I do. And also, I don't see sex differences in the incidence of, of learning disabilities. I mean, there's some research to suggest that, but I certainly, I see the same rate with um, um, females and males in, in terms of having these kind of difficulties. Sex differences in behaviour, for example, smaller than we often think, mm -hmm. but legitimate. It's just they're learned, they're taught, they're socialised. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where you say, well, you know, men and women are like this. And then, of course, I wonder what, why are women so strange? Why are they so different? Because you're imagining it, it's so, and then a few people have acted that way. But it's, it's kind of this weird... Um, implicit contract to believe stuff that isn't in fact true. Yes, I've heard that we almost talk things into existence and if one person does something, we label it as one thing and if another person does the same thing or another gender does the same thing, we label it differently. And another example I think is this, uh, if a young person forgets something, they'll say, oh, I'm having a blonde moment. But if an older person forgets something, I'm having a senior moment. Mm. Whereas neither of the two labels have any legitimacy, but we just tend to see things through different lenses according to what we expect yeah, to I, see. I think. I think it's very helpful when you talk about the world to remember that you're often talking about your own ideas. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not actually talking about necessarily something that's happening. And those ideas you have um, can hang together through all kinds of strange associations that have absolutely nothing to do with reality. They're just habit in your own head. So when we, when we say woman, that's then associated with housework, for example. Um, so there's woman's work. Does it actually have anything to do with men and women? No, but that's the association. And so it carries on, and we teach our children like that. Um, I'd also like to, like, uh, to ask a question about language. Um, there's this, uh, a community of Abri indigenous people, the Pompuri in Northern Australia, and because of the way uh, their language is structured, actually, I'm going to do this exercise with all of you. Can you point to North? Where's North? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're a five-year-old in Pompuri, you would know immediately where North was. And that's because in their language, they don't talk in terms of left or right or up or down. They talk in terms of the spoon is, is to the north of the fork. And so because of their, apparently, the theory is because of their language, they develop this innate skill to be able to know and orient themselves wherever they are. And, and you know, scientists have tested them with compasses, spun them around, flipped them upside down, and they know where north, south, east and west are at any time. And the hypothesis is it's because of their language, because of the way we, they speak. Would you like to comment Yes, on that? I mean, there's a famous hypothesis called the Whorfian hypothesis by Benjamin Lee Whorf, who has the idea that the way we think depends on our language, and it's been hugely controversial. Um, and that's a good example of where it might work. Uh, the more uh, common example is color, whether people's perception of, of color depends on the color words they use. 
So there are some uh, cultures that only have two or three words for color, other cultures that will have different words for different grades or different kinds of blue, for example. And the critical question is, does that mean they see color differently? Does the language determine how they actually see it? And I don't think we really know the answer to that, but it's a good question. I think, I think your example is a better one because you actually can demonstrate it, that their behavior uh, depends on how they use words to describe spatial relations. Mm. It's, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a controversial topic for, I don't know, 50 years, probably more. Similarly controversial is um, can, how powerful are our beliefs in terms of our abilities? You know, Gandhi said, you know, if, uh, if I don't believe I can do something, I can't do it. But if I believe that I can, then some, I will acquire the skills to n enable me. Mm -hmm. I mean, Comment on that. It, 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 not necessarily. I mean, there are, there are plenty of cases where um, very intense blinkered belief that something is possible is actually crushing. I mean, we have a word for it, it's delusion. Um, <laughs> so um, there isn't, you know, the idea of positive thinking, for example, isn't necessarily very helpful. Um, there are some cases where you need to be keenly aware of what we would call negative implications or your own limitations, your own flaws and vices and so on. Um, and but so that, that's one where it's really important. But there's also a limit on what beliefs can do. Um, they can be fairly clumsy, anarchical things, beliefs. And I think in some cases we're not actually sure what they are. We use these words, we have some vague ideas that are in a sort of procession that go in our minds every day. When you ask people to actually clarify their beliefs, they're often, often a lot more vague, mercurial and shifting and context dependent than they think they are. Um, we make all kinds of exceptions that we don't realise we make, um, depending on where we are and who we're with and, and what we want. So, yes, ideas and beliefs, absolutely important, but how they're weighted and arranged and clarified is often quite weird, very weird. There's an idea of Hume's that I often find really helpful, and that is a belief is just an idea we feel strongly about. It's, it's, it's a feeling, it's a sense of tangibility and intensity about a particular idea. It doesn't necessarily have to be true, it doesn't even necessarily have to make sense. It's just we've, we've sort of infused this idea with some kind of solidity, and then we will use all kinds of biases to keep that as intense as possible for as long as possible. Because it's sort of unpleasant to lose an idea that we believe. Mm -hmm. So for example, I mean, we see this with gender. Um, some people would rather call a woman, for example, unnatural for her talents than give up on the idea that she should be naturally one way or the other. We have all kinds of ways of keeping these ideas as tense as, tense as possible. But really, you know, they are just ideas. So I think potentials are probably pretty even to start with and are brought out differently by environments and education. They're not completely even, but I think there's much more evenness in potential than there is in what people achieve. My word of wisdom is um, keep exercising. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Yes.